On March 9th, Orange County voters in the 2nd Supervisorial District went to the polls in a special election to fill the vacant district seat. Out of a field of five candidates, former Costa Mesa Mayor Katrina Foley won that election. On March 26th, Foley took the oath of office in a ceremony at the county seat. In her inaugural statement, Foley, a Democrat, laid out a plan for governance that will touch on every person living in the district, laying out an ambitious agenda that will begin at the top with the Office of the Supervisor. What will we be doing in the next 100 days? Vaccinating Orange County. On the campaign trail, I talked about how we needed to get more vaccine out faster, more efficiently, and to more of our most vulnerable communities. Workforce development. This is a key priority for me. I'm so proud of my relationships with our labor friends and what we can do together to provide better jobs, to train people, and to actually make reforms within our criminal justice system tied to work, tied to creating apprentice earn and learn programs so that people have hope coming out of jail after making a mistake and have some path to being a good citizen. Climate action. This is a priority for our team as well. We will be announcing our Climate Action Sustainability Policy Advisor, and we will be forming a Climate Action Group. I know that in my briefings over the last 10 days, I've been learning about all the different pieces that different groups are working on here at the county. Orange County Transportation Authority, Waste and Recycling, the Flood Channel, John Wayne Airport, many different groups have different plans, but we don't have one Orange County Climate Action Plan that ties everything together and sets us up for a sustainable future. My district has beautiful beaches, a coastline. We have the Santa Ana River Trail that comes all the way from the mountains to the ocean. And we need to make sure that we're making plans for the future to protect our environment. Homelessness. Many of you heard me talk about preventing homelessness and what more we could do um, on the campaign trail. This is a priority for me. And I think that housing stability, whether you're young or whether you're a senior citizen, is so important to your mental health. So housing stability and housing our homeless, providing affordable housing for our families here in Orange County, especially people who are working three jobs and they still can't pay the rent, we can do better in Orange County. And I will have a team putting together recommendations and priorities, and you'll be hearing about that within the next month. One key priority for me is also going to be veterans services. Now, my brother is retired from the military. He served our country for 22 years in the Army. He himself struggles with PTSD and with so many issues that many of our military veterans whether veterans of the Vietnam War or veterans of the Iraq War have and are right here living with us in Orange County. I'm going to bring that knowledge and that personal experience that my family has. I'm going to be partnering with a group that we have formed to do a better job of serving our veterans here in Orange County. So stay tuned for more detail about that uh, because we can do better for our veterans. Transparency. I think sometimes 
We need to share more information. Let's start sharing more about the 25 departments and the 18,000 employees, many of whom are Orange County Employees Association employees and our friends who are here to serve you. Our goal is going to be to make sure that you know what services are available here in Orange County. There is so much that we learned during the campaign about what people don't know that the county provides. So we will have a constituent services team. We will have a north team and a south team to serve the district and to be more collaborative with the with the mayors, with the city managers, with the school districts, with the nonprofits, and with the community. We'll have weekly briefings, and we will answer questions for you, and we will try our best to be more transparent about what's happening in Orange County on the Orange County Board of Supervisors. I can't promise you we'll be perfect, but we'll be better. That's all I can say. <laughs> The first Democrat in decades to hold the second district seat, Supervisor Foley has attracted much interest and curiosity from constituents of all stripes as to the ambitious agenda she laid out in her first day in office. But sometimes as much or more can be learned from the promises a candidate makes before they're elected. We have the benefit of such an interview with Ms. Foley as a candidate for the March 9th election, laying out some of her then-proposed agendas in detail in the following Zoom interview one week before Vacancy she was election, elected. As they call it. I'm with today uh, Mayor Katrina Foley of Costa Mesa. So happy to have you uh, with us on this Zoom, uh, Zoom interview, Ms. Foley. Um, as Mayor of Costa Mesa, you've a, a fairly large city in Orange County. Still, I, can, I think we would classify most of our cities in Orange County as more or less bedroom communities. We don't have any Santa Monica's, we don't have any Los Angeles's. So power resides largely with the Board of Supervisors by default in that sense. You're a mayor of a city. A lot of challenges for Costa Mesa on a lot of fronts. Hopefully we can get to some of them. But what I'd like for you to do right now is explain to our voters, our viewers, why exactly you want to take this on, why you want to become second district supervisor for the County of Orange, and what makes you think that, um, that, that you are the right person for the job? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for asking that question. So I am, again, Katrina Foley. I'm Costa Mesa's first directly elected mayor. This is my third and final term as mayor. I've been on the city council for 12 years. I was a school board member for Newport Mesa, which is Newport Beach and Costa Mesa Public Schools. And I was also a planning commissioner in Costa Mesa. So I have a lot of local government experience. I'm also a small business owner for the last 22 years. I've owned my own law firm and I'm a lawyer for 24 years. But why am I running for the county uh, supervisor? I'm running because during the entirety of the time that I've been on the city council, while I was on the school board, what I have uh, uh, been involved in was a lack of representation by our county supervisor. We have not had the kind of support that as a mayor, as a school board member, a city council member, a resident, that I feel that we should have had. We haven't had support with regard to ending homelessness and getting those funds that flow from the state to the county and that are specifically earmarked for mental health services to flow back into the cities and to the school districts to help support those issues. In fact, the city of Costa Mesa has had to use its own general fund dollars for those purposes when the money is sitting in bank accounts, millions and millions of dollars at the county. It can't be used for anything else. We haven't had the support of the county during the COVID crisis. I mean, I know firsthand, I'm on calls every Friday with the county, with the health officer, and with all 34 mayors. And what happened at the beginning of the pandemic was Costa Mesa took the lead. You know, we, we stopped the Princess Cruz and the federal government from bringing COVID positive uh, patients to 
Fairview Development Center, which is right in the heart of Costa Mesa, without a plan. No plan, no understanding of the virus, no under no recognition or knowledge to uh, us that it was airborne and no plan for what to do if people uh, were infected with the virus who were working there and then out in our greater community. We think that by pushing back against that, we saved Orange County you know, many months of, of time to get ready and to plan, but, but they didn't do that. They undermined the public health officer, the county supervisors, uh, 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 were against masks, which we all now know is really one of our easiest, most simple ways to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, we ended up having a health officer resign because uh, they, she was being undermined. Uh, they, they characterized the COVID crisis as a hoax and just the flu. And then now everyone's trying to pay catch up. And now that the virus has spread and you heard Dr. Chow today on the press conference say, it's throughout the whole community. And so they're not even trying to isolate or uh, advise as to where there might be outbreaks because it's spread throughout the whole county of Orange. And it didn't have to go that way. We also, as mayors, continue to try to get help with regard to funding and the CARES Act and, and how could we get help with helping support our small businesses and our tenants with rent relief. And it really took a lot of work to get that support. That support should flow freely. The county supervisor representing District 2 should just be there asking what the funding and legislative priorities of the, each of the cities are and then help support them. That's their role. And certainly the county's job is to keep us all healthy and safe. So those are some of the top reasons that I am running for supervisor because I think I can do better and Orange County deserves better. So it sounds like what you're, what you're characterizing is a, is a crisis of, of essentially leadership at the, uh, on the DS uh, right. among the supervisors uh, themselves, um, each involved in their own uh, sort of uh, uh, power turf that, that uh, uh, keeps them involved, uh, you know, for their own districts, but, but they're, but the leadership factor at the county level, I think is what you're saying is lacking. Yeah, and I think that the failure to collaborate, the failure to uh, provide pragmatic representation, always politicizing everything, every last issue. In fact, just today, I have a city council meeting tonight, it starts at four o'clock, and we've asked over and over, can the health officer who is our city health officer, the way it works in Orange County, all the 34 cities have the county health officer as their health officer. We ask, can he come speak to our city council, answer questions about the vaccine, answer questions about concern about the variants that are happening, answer questions about uh, what are next steps in terms of reopenings and sports and schools. I mean, our council members have a lot of questions and uh, I get to participate on these calls, but I only get, you know, a very brief amount of time to ask my question with all the 34 mayors and time and time again, uh, it's politicized. And our chairman now is refusing to allow the health officer to come to Costa Mesa and answer questions. Hmm. That's outrageous. This is immoral, in my opinion. Right. Uh, early on, in fact, uh some of those, uh, some of the early outbreaks were, of course, the first outbreak was in Irvine. We know that that's documented. Uh, Newport Beach had early outbreaks. Both of those cities went to the county, went to the CEO of the county and asked that they, that those outbreaks be kept quiet uh, bec because it would create a quote stigma uh, uh, against those uh, very well healed uh, and, and politically connected cities. And so for a long time, the public was kept in the dark. But I want to ask you a question. Well, that's a pattern. That's a pattern that the county has that we need to shine some light on. They've kept all of us in the dark over the last year with secret contracts. You know, the outbreaks uh, have been secret as well. But school outbreaks, colleges that have had outbreaks, sports teams, uh, contracts for millions and millions and millions of dollars that are just being signed and approved without any public input. 
So yes, that's a pattern that must change. So let me put this in the form of a question to you. As a supervisor, put on your supervisor hat for just a moment. And how would you view the rollout of on-campus learning in the second district where there are a number of school districts that have opened and several that have not yet and are fearful of doing so. Where do you come, where do you fall in, in, in that spectrum? So, so just to clarify, that's just my personal opinion because the board has no jurisdiction over the school openings. So the board does not get to decide whether schools are open or not. The board doesn't get to direct the county health official as to whether schools open or not. Uh, in fact, that's being done at both the state level and at the individual district level. So actually there's only one school district in uh, Costa Mesa, it's Newport Mesa Unified School District. Oh. And uh, they've been open in kind of a hybrid. Elementary school has been going on for quite a while. Uh, high school just went back a couple of weeks ago. And as I was saying today, uh, the, the sport team started uh, yesterday. So uh, there's school districts uh, across Orange County that are opening or not opening, depending on the spread of the virus in their community. And I think that's key. I think each school district is different because if you live in Anaheim and you're in the area in Anaheim where there is a hot spot and there's a large spread of the virus, it's gonna to be tough to open high school because you could cause it to spread even further, right? But if you are in South County where there's very little virus spread, or if you're in Costa Mesa or Newport Beach or any number of other cities, Los Alamitos, uh, Cyprus, there's, there's really Rossmore, very little spread in some of these areas. So you might be okay to open so long as you know you have protocols in place, the teachers and the school community get vaccinated, which they're starting to do already. Um, you require masks and you practice social distancing, washing your hands, et cetera. So there's just, in my opinion, it depends on the area. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that that's what's happening in Orange County. And, and it's, I think we're starting to see more and more schools reopen. Yeah. Kids need to get back to school. My husband works for the County Department of Ed, not for Costa Mesa. His school is in Fountain Valley. And he's been back to school in the classroom since the fall. Yeah. Do you think the county should be a little more proactive in terms of its, not necessarily control of, but its uh, interactions with uh, school districts in terms of documenting on campus infection rates and transmission rates uh, before they become community-wide? Yeah, so, so here's what people may not know if you're not like married to a teacher or not involved with the schools, um, is that uh, the school, each school site is actually sending out to the teachers uh, the number of cases at the school every day. And so there is transparency at the school site level. Mm -hmm. What I see the bigger problem as happening is that the board of supervisors is prohibiting transparency, essentially. It's happening internally. And if you happen to, to know someone, but they have this, what I, I think is, is wrong, a uh, policy that negates transparency. They don't wanna share the information on the public website and just on a link right. that people can just go to and look for themselves. I mean, you have to really know someone or know the system to be able to get information about uh, the spread of the virus and about contracts and about the sites as an example for the testing and I mean, not testing the vaccine. You know, we as mayors, we ask every week can you give us a list of the sites that you are looking to open up both uh, super pods, mobile clinics, community clinics, and then tell us, you know, even if you can't tell us the exact date, just give us some estimated time frames so we can start to prepare in our communities and get the word out. Right. They won't do it. So there's a, it's a problem of transparency and an unwillingness to share with the public the information that they know internally. 
that's a problem for me that I just don't even know why. I, I can't understand it. I don't understand what the motivation is uh, for keeping everything so secret. Right. I've often wondered that myself. <laughs> and, and, but there, there is another topic I'd like to move to because uh, it's going to affect every every community in the county and the county itself. You're going to have to deal with it if you're elected on March 9th. In the state of California, we have something called a housing assessment a cycle. We are in the sixth cycle of that housing assessment right now. And that means that uh, it's sort of gong time for the cities to respond uh, individually to the state of California's mandates for increased housing, especially low and moderately low income housing in all uh, municipalities and regional uh, <clears throat> zones of, of the state of California. It affects every city, all 400 and some cities, and uh, all 58 counties, certainly in Orange County. A number of cities, I believe 15 of them, have already responded with appeals. Costa Mesa is one of those cities that is appealing. Our Los Alamitas is another, I believe Cyprus is another. Uh, so we're very keenly interested in knowing what your take on all of this is, what, where, you, where your position would fall in terms of housing, especially low and moderately low income housing, in terms of zoning for those uh, eventualities in each of the municipalities under the uh, state uh, requirement for uh, what they call RENA housing. W what's your take on that issue? Yeah, thanks. Uh, RENA stands for Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Uh, so many cities appealed, but all the appeals have been denied. So we're moved past that. Um, the reason for most of the cities to appeal was more to do with the fact that the timeline for completing the number of housing units that you were assigned to build is very short, eight years. And for a city like Costa Mesa, for example, they assigned us 11,733 units to be built in eight years. And for the most part, we're a built out city and any place that is not built out uh, that's open land requires an act of the legislature to open up and be able to build there. So that takes time. And certainly eight years is in this life, not quite enough time. So we were concerned that if we didn't get all those units built within the eight years, that we're gonna get some kind of large penalty from the state because they don't even give you credit for you know, progress towards or good faith effort. So that's why we appealed. Um, and we also appealed because there was some uh, concern that maybe some of the allocation was double, there was like a double counting of some sort uh, that gave us double the number of units that we were supposed to build, but that's been all uh, refuted. And so, so we are engaging like many cities in Orange County in our housing element process in an attempt to try to meet the, the compliance of the housing units that have been assigned. And where, where I see the role of the supervisor in this process in district two is there's no regional kind of a, a collaborative effort going on. So you've got cities that are next to each other and they're working isolated on their housing elements. They're not talking to each other about, oh, maybe we put it all on a corridor here and it doesn't impact traditional single family residential neighborhoods. Maybe we put it all along the 405. Maybe we uh, you know, place it on the 55 if you're between Costa Mesa and Newport. If you're in Huntington Beach and Seal Beach, maybe there's places that we can all decide that this is where the best place to build density is. OK, so so there's no regional kind of a leadership going on. So I think that I can play a role in that. I've been in local office, planning commissioner, city council member dealing with housing issues for many, many years. I understand it quite well as it relates to uh, low income, affordable workforce housing. We must we must get with the program. We can no longer uh, depend that people can live in Corona and drive in for a $15 an hour job at a restaurant. I mean, it's just, you can't afford it. The math doesn't work. <laughs> and so we need to build workforce housing 
and it needs to be quality housing. And I also think if we build near job centers, then you reduce traffic, you reduce trip counts, you won't have what I think many residents are concerned about, which is uh, extra traffic in the neighborhood, and you'll be able to uh, address the, the housing units. But it's going to be tough. A lot of good, a lot of hard conversations, um, and uh, it'll take a, a lot of planning to get it done. And again, probably a little leadership. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would, would you consider partnering with cities as, as a county representative now, partnering with cities and maybe even doing a little parlaying for some of that county property uh, that's out there um, and and negotiating with cities to perhaps share uh, utilization of that property for, for density housing? Is that a possibility? W would you consider that as a supervisor? Yeah, like I said earlier, I really do think there's a role to be played as the county supervisor to help to formulate a regional plan where cities aren't just on an island taking care of their own housing unit needs, but they're thinking about what, how does that impact my next door neighbor and how does it benefit my next door neighbor? So I do think there's a role to play to help everybody, you know, come to the table and start to look at it as an Orange County plan, an Orange County housing plan. Now, do I think that's easy? Absolutely not. It's super challenging. And I, I, I'm sure there's a reason why no one's thought of it. And that is because it's too hard, <laughs> but you know, that never stopped me before. And I um, often try to think outside the box because I, I do think that it's important for us to collaborate and, and utilize county unincorporated land, utilize um, each other and in terms of trying to plan for the future. You know, it's all part of also a climate action plan. Housing and transportation are inextricably intertwined in terms of addressing climate action. And so we must think of it kind of more broadly in that, in that scope as well. Yeah, let's talk about a regional plan. Uh, and again, talking about housing, uh, we, we, we come upon the subject of the homeless issue in Orange County. Certainly, Certainly a regional, regional plan, plan is required, required. Regional, regional collaborations with local uh, authorities. I, I think what we've landed, landed on, on in Orange, Orange County, County is a kind of a, kind of a uh, maybe, maybe by, by default, default, maybe by plan, a shelter first philosophy toward, toward the homeless. homeless. I think that's, that's where, where we have, have as, a as a county, decided, decided they belong. belong. Uh, that's, that's where we, where we have invested, invested uh, finances, finances of the county, the county such, such as they are, uh, into, into the, the homeless, homeless issue, issue, is in creating a shelter environment. environment. To, what to what extent do you support that uh, philosophy, a shelter first philosophy, as opposed, as opposed to, let's say, a housing first philosophy? philosophy? Where, do where do you come down, down in, in, in the spectrum uh, of that, that uh, argument? argument? My philosophy is housing first, not shelter first. In our city, we have a housing first model. Uh, when I became mayor in 2018 and our new council came on board, we'd had 20 plus years of no one doing anything about preventing homelessness in our city. It had caused people to themselves deteriorate on the streets and in the parks and our neighborhoods to deteriorate. And so we set about um, developing a plan. It's been a very, very effective plan and <laughs> housed 170 people since 2019 um, in our uh, program. We don't just shelter people. We provide services that help them to get their lives stabilized. We, if they're living on the streets, we have caseworkers and social workers that go out onto the streets and have a housing first uh, approach, trying to get them into recuperative care. These are city employees? employees? Yes. Yes. Social workers. We also work with nonprofits in the community. And we have, we, you know, we're fortunate. We have a, a lovely faith-based community in Costa Mesa that's very diverse, yeah. that they have created a task force and they provide a lot of extra hands and eyes and listening for us in terms of addressing homelessness in our city. It's a model that's effective and it is taking people off the streets and into housing and 
And one key piece of it, and this is also why I'm running for supervisor, is that mental health service funding that goes from the state to the county that can't be used for anything else but mental health services, we cannot get the county to give us any of that funding to support programs like this, to support the social worker that we hire, that her only job is to monitor people for a period of time while they're in the new housing so that it sticks, as, you, as they say, so that they stay, they get stabilized, and then they become independent. And that is a mental health issue in many, many respects. Many reasons why people fall out of housing right, right when they get in is because they're not mentally well at the time. And whether they were mentally ill before they were on the streets, living on the streets, having your body degrade, having your mental health degrade, you, you have mental health issues if you've been on the streets for too long or in the parks, et cetera. So that funding can be used for cities. And that is a priority for me. I know we've finally got Newport Beach to adopt our model. So Newport Beach is now adopting the Costa Mesa model, the housing first model, ha utilizing caseworkers and social workers out on the streets, um, trying to place people. And then for those individuals, temporarily to stay in the shelter while they're getting uh, assessed so that they can get placed into permanent supportive housing. That's the successful model. It's a less expensive model. It's an efficient model and it's a model that is compassionate and humane. And that's what I'll be supporting as a, a supervisor. Does, 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 does the, the uh, refurbishing and reconstituting of the music jail detention, detention center, center uh, fit, fit into, into your, your support, support of, of housing, housing first? first? You know, that's an issue that has come up and I've been trying to do a deep dive barely because, you know, we learned about this election very late. It's been a very compacted election period. Normally you'd have a year to learn about all the different issues in the county and, and take a position on them. So I'm still learning about that issue and learning about where it is in the process. But I will tell you that, in my opinion, jail is not the solution to ending homelessness. And you, and think, you think that this model, model that you have in Costa Mesa, Mesa would be applicable, applicable would, would be would, would be expandable to a, a countywide uh, template? We've already got Newport to agree, you know, and Huntington Beach, we've been working collaboratively with them a lot. I think that they're moving in that direction. I work really closely with Mayor Carr and Council Member Del Glaze. Um, they're very uh, supportive of this type of approach. Uh, I know that in talking with uh, residents as well as Mayor Shaver in Stanton, that Stanton has had a lot of struggles with people mm -hmm. living on the streets and homelessness. And it doesn't seem to be whatever the county's doing, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, and so I do think the model is uh, a quality model that's based on compassion, care, but also, you know, people want to have a quality community as well. So I think we're able to accomplish all of those things. And you think it's expandable countywide, the model? Yeah. And okay. I think less expensive than what, uh, what we're doing now. Oh, yeah. It's less expensive. Than law enforcement involvement? Yes every day of the week one last and they top don't, by the way law enforcement they don't want to do it no you know they, they don't want to be social workers no, they they're don't. not that's not why they signed up to be police officers or sheriffs they don't want to do that work and so the more we can get a more holistic approach going i think it's better for everyone okay let me try and squeeze in one more topic because i think this is a county-wide issue that maybe not everybody is aware of it's not on everybody's radar right now but it, it, it's, uh, we're aware of it in West Orange County and some of our smaller cities, especially because it's going to hit us, hit municipal uh, governments very hard. And that is this, uh, this bill, SB 1383, which is the, the, the uh, uh, sort of now coming due. It was a bill that was passed in 2000 in variations in 2013 and then even before that. But right now it's on everybody's table because in 2021, at the end of this year in 2021, it's going to become enforceable by the state of California. And what this bill does is it's going to require every single municipality, every single 
property owner who has curbside waste management service to begin to alter their approach to dividing up their waste. We, we don't really have an organic waste disposal barrel yet. We have a recycle barrel. We have a, um, you know, a green barrel typically. It depends on the city. It depends on your city. We do in yeah. Costa Mesa. Oh, you do? You, so yeah. you have four barrels now? No, it's weird. We have two barrels and an organics waste. And then in Irvine, they also have three barrels and an organic waste barrel. Yeah. So, so, so it depends on the city. Yeah. So this is rather ominous for especially small cities of which we have a number in the second district. You're going to have to deal with it. Uh, and these folks are very adamant that the, this, again, unfunded mandate by the state of California is going to cost municipalities dearly that because the state is going to require municipalities to officially monitor and report to the state of California what, you know, whether people are complying, whether commercial properties, even residential properties, are complying with the state mandate for this separation of organic material now um, from other materials uh, for, for uh, re redistribution, reuse of some kind. Although the state doesn't, it's not very, very specific on what that reuse is as yet. Um, they're not providing any certainly financial substrate for that. But um, uh, it, it, it's, it's an issue that's on a lot of minds of a lot of city managers in this second district. And I wonder if, if you have a position on it, if you're aware of what's coming down the line, and if you have want to share that uh, with your viewers. Yes. Thank you. So I'm well aware of it. We just had a briefing uh, at our city about the uh, the planning. And, and I'll say this, we also discussed this on our every Thursday night at 7.30. One of the silver linings of COVID is that all the mayors now get on a Zoom call, all 34 mayors every Thursday night at 7.30. And we share ideas, we share concerns, challenges. Um, uh, we write letters and support and oppose to different things. And so that's been really, we never had done that before. So that's good. Well, I never got I never got an invitation. Is the press invited? <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, but we do. Uh, but we do. We have been talking about this. The mayors all have been talking about this, and okay. and most cities are well into the planning for this. Now, it's also every city is different. So we have in Costa Mesa, for example, we have Costa Mesa Sanitary District. So we don't do our own trash, right? And then in other cities, they handle that themselves. So every city is going to be a little different. Uh, but uh, one of the projects that I would like to see uh, move forward, and it'll be a priority for me as the supervisor, is Waste Not OC. So Waste Not OC was something that started a couple years ago. The county uh, gave a grant to this organization so that they could collect the food waste from various different restaurants, repurpose that food that wasn't perishable and that could be sent out to shelters and, and different food banks, et cetera, and then use the rest of the food waste for you know, repurposing it for fuel purposes, et cetera. So they lost their grant a couple years ago. And so they haven't been able to continue that service in the community. Now with this requirement, I see us moving in the direction of expanding Waste Not OC. Costa Mesa was the first city to participate in Waste Not OC. It expanded to a variety of other cities, but we need to expand it countywide. So that will be a priority. How do we do that? How can we have the benefit of that program that's a countywide program for the cities so that they can benefit from that work as well? And that can be part of their plan to comply with this, uh, this new bill. We have to comply. There's no, there's no out. And it's also, you know, it's going to be better for the planet in the long run. It's just hard to get it going. It's going to be, it'll be the top, you know, it's like a learning curve. It's going to be a little bit of a struggle at the beginning, a little bit more costly than people want to spend at the beginning, but it'll, I think, uh, manage itself out. And in the long run, we'll all be better for it. Well, we're, we're running out of natural landfill. Uh, yeah. And that that's the, uh, uh, that's that's the sort of backstory on you know why this is all happening. We're we're running out of places to bury right. trash, right. Uh, and uh, uh, but I I'm wondering if you could just 
take the last minute or two to flush out a bit of how the county would interact in this process. What, what role do you see the county playing uh, among all of the 34 cities uh, attempting at various levels to scramble and respond to this uh, yeah. act? At the city of today, all I can confidently tell you, because I don't like to talk about things I don't know, <laughs> but all I can confidently tell you is this way it's not OC program, the county can fund that and that can be a countywide program. I see. The city today, that's what I can tell you. Uh, but also the county has its own requirements, just like any city. Right. And so they'll be having to do their own uh, compliance. Uh, I don't know, as we sit here today, what other role the county can play to serve and help the resident. I mean, the, the cities. But that is something that I'll find out. And I think what the county supervisor must do that has not been happening is a better job of serving the cities in their district. The county supervisor is supposed to be meeting with the cities, understanding their priorities, their challenges, their funding needs, and working collaboratively with them to support the cities. That is the role of the county supervisor. It has not happened in the entirety of the time I've been on the city council. Uh, even before when I wasn't mayor, it didn't happen. So um, that has to change. And I will make sure that we are more collaborative. Okay, well, uh, candidate Katrina Foley, we will find... Well, it's Supervisor Foley as of today, That's right. I, I, I take it. Um, you were sworn in this morning. You are now our second district supervisor for our town of Los Alamitos and our broadcast area, Seal Beach, Cypress, Stanton and areas of West Orange County. We're very excited to have you on board. Well, I can't wait to serve. Uh, yes, and uh, you've made some very um, frank statements in your, in your candidate uh, uh, question and answer that we've done with you uh, before you were elected, and now that you are elected, uh, we're all gonna hold them to you, help oh, you to them. I hope you do, because if, uh, if you do, that means I'll be successful in the position. <laughs> okay, just a word. Just an update on a couple of things that you said previously. You talked about, and here today, again, you talk about unifying, a, a really message of unity across the county. And, um, and you also talked about something a little more provocative, and that was uh, an, uh, your statement that the county was, uh, uh, I think the word you used was in a position of negative transparency. I think negative transparency is the word you used. That's going, to, the, the idea of secrecy within government in Orange County is on a lot of folks' minds right. these days with regards to the COVID issue, the healthcare response, uh, the homeless issue, uh, and many more issues as well. How are you going to, oh, what shall we say, crack that nut? How are you going to open the County of Orange to a more transparent, uh, type of arrangement, uh, all of your 25, as you said today, districts or, or agencies, departments, yeah. departments, how are you going to open them up and open the county up so that there is more transparency in Orange County? Well, I think the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have regular weekly briefings with the media where, where we will be giving both information about different departments and what they're working on, as well as updates on the status of our priorities and our initiatives. That right there is something no one has ever done. So that will be a, a way for us to get more information out, be more transparent about what we're doing and answer questions. You know, I, I don't have all the answers. I learn every day something I didn't know yesterday. And I am just hopeful that we can pull people together and find some way to get some basic facts basic factual assumptions about some of these critical issues that plague our community. Issues such as homelessness, housing, the airport and the pollution and the noise coming out of the airport. Issues such as criminal justice. And I can't wait to partner with our sheriff and our, and our other law enforcement entities as well as our nonprofits and our labor family to bring initiatives forward collaboratively. That's the key. Okay, we look <laughs> okay. forward to seeing you uh, on the streets. Thank you. At our end of the county. Take care. Looking forward to meeting you all. Supervisor Foley. Thank you.